Good morning. Happy Fosh Knot Day. I hear they don't have any calories in them either. What can I say? I want to remind everybody that, um, that this could be recording, so temper your comments. Not like Jason Kelsey, but for recording, okay? Um, today, uh, my name is Kate Harper. I'm the Majority Chairman of the House Local Government Committee, and we're having a hearing on Representative Bernstein's House Bill 1405 regarding uh, municipalities that uh, sell their own electricity and uh, rates and things like that. So we're going to be hearing from um, Representative Bernstein, who's part of the panel first, and Representative <coughs> Bernstein has a constituent with him, Brian Bush. Yes. And although we don't have a court stenographer here, you may consider yourselves to be sworn, okay, and testify truthfully as a result of that. We will also be hearing from other boroughs that sell electricity, as well as uh, Patrick Cicero from the Municipal Pennsylvania Utility Law Project, and um, Beverly... I'm gonna I'm gonna blow this. I think in Arumo. Anna Rumo. Thank well, you. Well, that was much. loud. Sorry, Madam Chair. Anna Rumo. Okay, president of Elwood City Hospital. Okay, so um, the purpose of the hearing is to shed light on the bill that is in the local government committee and to hear um, opposing views, quite frankly, uh, of uh, the uh, wisdom of the, of moving the legislation forward. So um, I'm going to ask uh, all the first. I'm going to ask Chairman Freeman to make opening remarks. Then I'm going to go around and and ask each member of the panel up here to introduce themselves. Chairman Freeman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, no real remarks. Just look forward to today's testimony and hope it's enlightening as we uh, examine this legislation closer. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Starting here at the end. Say, uh, I think the best way to do it is not to give your number, but to say what county you represent. Because yeah. most people in the public don't remember what the district numbers are. Yeah, so I'm Representative Dave Zimmerman. Uh, I represent kind of the northeast part of Lancaster County. Representative Jeff Whelan. I uh, bode from the great county of Lycoming. Basically represent uh, the Williamsport and surrounding municipalities. Kate Harper, Montgomery County. Uh, Bob Freeman, Northampton County. Jeannie McNeil, Lehigh County. Paul Schemmel, Franklin County. Uh, Park Wentlane, um, parts of Lawrence, Mercer, Crawford, Neary Counties. Ross Diamond, uh, Northern and Eastern Lebanon County, and this is a very interesting issue to me because we don't have any of these uh, municipalities in, in my district or my county. Gary Day, uh, parts of Lehigh and Berks County, including Kutztown Borough. Tom Haffey, Dolphin County. Rich Irvin, Huntington County, and parts of Center and Mifflin County. Brett Miller, Lancaster County. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Bernstein, are you ready to begin? I am. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, Take it away. Uh, thank you so much for my colleagues for, for coming today. It's it's great to see you. It's been about a week or so, so it's, it's great to be back. And Madam Chair and Mr. Chairman, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you for allowing this hearing to take place. I appreciate your commitment to transparency in order to bring light to the merits of House Bill 1405. Today, you'll hear from those in favor and those opposed to House Bill 1405, just as it should be. This is a bill that is broad-based, it's bipartisan in nature, with State Representative Pam Snyder and I being the co-prime sponsors. This bill is also supported by 84 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives, that's 84. Additionally, it is also supported by a majority of members of this local government committee. This legislation is also endorsed by groups such as the AARP, Pennsylvania Utility Law Project, PA Manufacturers Association, PA Realtors Association, and I think the greatest accomplishment of all, talk about bipartisan work, is this is also endorsed by Americans for Prosperity and the SEIU 32BJ. I can't think of a time where that's happened, so I think that's, that's absolutely a, a great thing as we work, to, as we work on bipartisan uh, legislation together. This legislation was, induced, was introduced in order to solve a problem. 
a real problem that I uncovered while knocking on doors across districts with municipal electric monopolies. For far too long, people have been taken advantage of in these areas where they were told by their state legislators that nothing could be done and this was local government at its best. Well, today we have an opportunity to show people in this Commonwealth that Harrisburg will step in to protect residents against an egregious monopoly. People are hurting. They're hurting deeply. Businesses are struggling to stay afloat and nonprofits are being exploited. But today, you'll hear the stories of why House Bill 1405 is necessary to stop this overreach by boroughs that operate municipal electric monopolies. Madam Chair, I didn't want to take the full 15 minutes because I know we have some folks that travel quite a distance here. Um, so I'll turn it over to my constituent, Mr. Mr. Brian Bush, and if it's okay, I'll, I'll find a place up here if that's acceptable. Well, um, before you do that, yes, and my thought would be to allow questions after both of you have sure. spoken, but you didn't give a brief explanation of what your bill does, and I think that would be helpful, especially to people who might, um, you know, not be understand absolutely that. I'd be happy to madam chair thank you um, the bill does it's really two primary parts of the pieces of legislation and House Bill 1405 does two separate things uh, number one currently today um, these municipal electric monopolies and these boroughs 35 of them across the Commonwealth are using this as a taxation tool so what they are doing is they're charging excess rates in electricity they're then going and purchasing electricity um, and then they are charging their customers a higher amount of money. They are then using that money to fund borough operations. And what you'll see with this is, and the very unique part about this is the following. Just like many of you up here that may not live in a place with a municipal electric monopoly, you have the opportunity to purchase your electric from a different supplier and you can go out and shop those rates and you can go out and, and have a lower cost of electricity and we know that electricity is, is not inexpensive but it is a necessary to live our daily lives. These individuals do not have that opportunity and they are locked into this monopoly that charges extremely high rates and we'll talk about those high rates um, as we work through the process. Additionally, these, these monopolies are not bound by the PUC, the Public Utility Commission. And what we see with that is... What does your bill do? Correct. So it, it does not allow, Madam Chair, it does not allow for the transfer in the excess... Uh, it does not allow for the transfer of money from the electric fund into the general fund. That is one component. The second component is just like all most of us up here have the opportunity to have uh, be represented in um, with the PUC. So with the PUC, they protect us from egregious companies. These residents in these municipalities do not have PUC protection. Now, our legislation does not put them under the PUC, but it puts very very similar pieces. Um, of protections in place that the PUC grants typical residents. So two components, one is a protection, consumer protection side, and the other is the fact that it really doesn't allow um, people to transfer that money from the electric fund into the general fund and use it as a taxation tool. Thanks, so Thank we'll hear you. from Mr. Bush now. And um, a representative, you wanna just wait and see if we get any questions, yeah, go ahead. First of all, I want to thank uh, State Representative State, uh, Aaron Bernstein for allowing me to speak and on behalf of everyone here in this room. I appreciate it. Uh, for two years, I've been trying to get my point across, or even longer than that, um, about the, the LC Electric um, municipality uh, being able to charge whatever they want to charge uh, for electric rates. For the longest time, their invoices wouldn't even say a kilowatt per hour. It would just gave the amount in a rate adjustment for whatever they need as a taxation tool to cover the general funds. <clears throat> for many times, I was trying to fight this. I would go to State Representative Jared Gibbons, and he said this was a state and lo or local um, problem to fight it out at the local community, that he cannot do anything about it. Went to uh, Senator Vogel, he basically said the same thing. Finally, um, Aaron Bernstein, State Representative Aaron Bernstein, um, heard and listened to us. 
I am a business owner and a landlord of a few tenants. I like to tell a few stories about a few of my tenants. One being Karen, her name is Karen, I won't give last names. Her name is Karen, she has a handicapped child, it's in wheelchair bound. For the longest time, she can't afford um, the electric rates because they just go up and she can't budget anything because she has no idea what the rates are going to be through what next, next month. I go and visit her, she's in the dark at eight o'clock at night. I said, why are you in the dark? She said, I can't afford the LSE electric. It's either food or insurance or medication for me and my son. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting choked up from these stories. But it's real. <clears throat> Another story is Mario. He's a military and he's a truck driver. He, <clears throat> he fights for us, fights for our freedom. And he comes home and because of the electric office being that you have to pay within two weeks from getting your bill, his electric got shut off, leaving his wife and kids um, in the dark and the food went sour because the wife wasn't there. He had to come up with the money, plus the next day he had to come up with the money to get it turned on and he got it back on. Another story, Debbie and her husband, her husband is EMT. They just told me that they wouldn't be able to pay the rent because they had to pay the utility bill or it would get shut off. There's more stories, but I'll just keep it at three. One last story, I sold roses last year, right around Valentine's Day. I had a young male adult come up to me and want to buy one rose for his daughter. I was selling it for $4.25. He looked at me and says, I'm sorry, I don't have $4.25. I got to pay my electric. He wanted it for his daughter, but he wasn't able to afford it because of electric. <clears throat> I gave that to him because I felt that was more important. <clears throat> I hope you people in this room will listen to the bill 1405 and help us, the people of Elwood City and other boroughs in the state. We do not have anybody to go to call for PUC where other people that do. Duquesne Light, Penn Power, you can call them and you can, if they do a rate adjustment or whatever, you have somebody that you can go to. <clears throat> These people do not, I do not, I don't have a voice I can call or nothing. <clears throat> I like to end it there and I hope you have a heart. The next time you are anywhere having your dinner or whatever, <clears throat> and knowing that Karen, Mario, and Debbie are in the dark because they can't afford their electric bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take questions. Or, I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. And Mr. Bush, thank you for your attendance today with the long trip that you made from Western Pennsylvania. Right. Welcome. That was Elwood City, right? That's correct. Right. Okay. Um, questions? Th thank you for the explanation of the bill. <clears throat> I, I am a co-sponsor of the bill uh, because you approached me when you first introduced it. And... <clears throat> You, you detailed the problem to me as you saw it. I do want to ask you though, in your testimony, you said that these, um, these constituencies, ratepayers, need similar protections to what the PUC offers, but you're not putting this under the jurisdiction of the PUC. Why would you not simply put this under the jurisdiction of the PUC? Because in, in most people's minds, when they talk about a municipality that's selling electric, they would consider that a public utility. So if you could detail the reasons why you wouldn't put this under the ju jurisdiction of the PUC, I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Representative Diamond, and thank you for your support of being a co-sponsor on the legislation as well. Um, the rationale and the reason that we did not put it directly under the PUC was um, we also, we know that there are some additional costs that boroughs have, or that, that PUC members would have to incur if they went under the PUC. And I did not want to put that cost on the backs of taxpayers in those boroughs and in those municipalities. So I thought that it was able to, to achieve the same result in a less costly manner for the residents. And, and can you detail exactly what those protections would be? Just for like a bullet points of the protections that I, I, that I, those rate payers would. I can. Would expect. My folder is right up in front of Representative Schemmel. If I could okay. grab that for one moment. All right, sure.
If you just give me one moment, Representative Diamond, thank you. I'll go off the cuff with it. How's that, Representative Diamond? If I miss some, I'll, I'll come back to you on it. Um, basically, a couple things where, and they have to do in, um, the, additionally, by the way, from Pennsylvania Utility Law Project, Mr. Cicero will also address some of these that, that were in nature. But what we also had were, um, they were things such as shutoffs in the middle of winter. So there is nothing right now that these municipal electric monopolies, um, they can shut people's electric off in January and in February. We've seen it happen. It has to do with things such as um, rate increases. So the fact that they can't just jack up rates arbitrarily in certain areas, uh, in certain times. It has to do with some other things that deals with um, the regulation of deposits and in, in poor people. This is really a tax on poor people. Um, so those are some of the things that it has to do with the PUC. And I can get you the full right. list so, of it. So let me help you with that. Because I, I unbelievably, we don't have a copy of the bill on the folders. I, I have my own. I brought it with me. But if you look at the bill, what Representative Bernstein has done was put in what are typically considered to be PUC type consumer protections into the bill. So instead of going to the PUC, his bill proposes these protections. That's correct, Madam Chair. In the bill, okay, that, yeah. that's how it relates to 1405. So. Yes, Madam Chair, okay. thank you. Fair enough? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Representative, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, next question, Chairman Freeman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Bernstein, for your testimony and the testimony of your constituent, Mr. Bush. Um, just a couple of quick questions. Um, it's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that one of the reasons for this legislation was because in Elwood City the rates would fluctuate considerably from month to month, is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Now, given the fact that there's some 30, 35 other municipalities that operate and provide electricity, uh, are you aware of whether any of them have had that same sort of drastic fluctuation? Yeah, I can tell you that our, our data and our research and is, is I don't know about the exact, the, the fluctuation. Now, I've heard stories from folks, but I'm, I'm also careful to understand that I want to know the facts and the data behind sure. it. What and that's understood. We'll hear from them correct. anyway. As far as yeah, what, what we've seen is um, that the, the, the rates are significantly higher in those areas. Um, and, and we've seen that to be factual and we have the evidence in, in the background to, to showcase that. Okay, and we'll hear from them uh, Absolutely. after your testimony. Um, in your legislation, as I understand it, you do provide that um, if the municipality would follow, I guess, the regulations or guidelines of the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland interconnection, mm -hmm. they would not have to abide by the, the various provisions of your bill. Uh, can you tell us what that organization is? Yeah, I can tell you that uh, that, that particular organization is the one that um, would apply directly to Chambersburg. And the reason that, that that would be appropriate in that manner is Chambersburg is unique in their own way. Um, Chambersburg actually produces and creates their own electricity, while the remainder of them do not. Some so do, Chambersburg not, not would not be them. affected by this legislation. But uh, to follow up, um, you outline in your bill that if you follow the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland interconnection, you wouldn't have to follow the other guidelines in your legislation. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is the nature of that organization? Is it a private organization? Is it a public organization? Uh, is it a quasi-public organization? Yeah, I would tell you that the uh, individual that helped us put that together is not here today that, um, that, that we worked on that with, so I don't have a specific answer for that okay. question. Well, perhaps we can hear from the uh, municipal electrical folks on that. Um, and currently in Elwood City, is there a millage uh, levied for property tax? There is. And what is it at this point, do you know? Offhand? Yeah, I do, I have that. Um, that millage is, that millage of property taxes is currently 8.75, which is the second highest in the entire county of Lawrence. Okay, and do you know offhand, and you're not a municipal official from there, so you don't have to have this answer, but would you know how much that generates in revenue for the, for the community? How much the millage rate does? Yeah. I do not know. Okay. Um, if I, I, I do know, Mr. Chairman, if I could expand. Sure. I do know that the transfer of electric funds to the general fund is $1.45 million. Okay. So if that were to stop under your legislation, yeah. it's logical to assume that the millage would have to go up 
uh, of real estate taxes in order to compensate for the loss of that revenue? Uh, not necessarily, Mr. Chairman. What I would share with you is there's also another option that I think we should look at a little bit more sometimes here in Harrisburg, and that's to stop some egregious spending that's happening in these areas. Can you enlighten us as to what kind of egregious spending has occurred? In Elwood City particularly? Yes. I can. I can tell you that there are police officers in Elwood City that make, if you could hold on to your seat there, I don't want you to fly off of it, that's $170,000 plus a year by scamming an overtime system. We have other uh, beyond egregious spending um, that exists there, but that's just one particular example. It is probably logical to assume, though, even with cutting back in certain areas of spending, that if you take away the ability to transfer the revenues from the electrical generation, that you're going to see property taxes increase. Yeah, I don't know that that's actually the case. I think that once again, there's an opportunity to be, be responsible government. And the other thing that I would share with this, and it's pretty clear and pretty straightforward, is as you know, there's about 2,000 municipalities across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And there's about 35 of these that are able to use this monopoly as a tool for the manner in which they're using it. So my question is very simply, Mr. Chairman, what would the other 2,000 do? Um, they would behave in a manner that is consistent with Pennsylvania law, and we're just asking these people to do the same. Well, I think the point would be that um, in many of those communities uh, that are not under this legislation, or under the ability to levy this kind of uh, electric rate, um, some communities might like that benefit because it probably keeps their property taxes lower than it would be otherwise. Yeah, I look forward to hearing from um, PMEA and their municipal or taxpayer funded lobbyists later today um, where we hear from them because we have documentation and proof that that's actually the opposite. I'll be curious about that. Thank you. Um, and finally, have, we got some more questions. So one or two, and I, I, okay. I promise I'll finish up. Uh, currently, because the electric rates are charged on all um, rate payers, mm -hmm. that means that nonprofits as well as residential properties pay towards the municipal. It's correct. If, if that's restricted just to the actual generation, um, they would not pay any property taxes or the municipal taxes. Is that correct? Well, I think they would operate just as the other 2,000 municipalities do. And I also think that it's not appropriate to put an additional tax on schools. Um, I think we consistently hear here in Harrisburg, just as the governor said the other day, we need more money in schools. And these 35 municipalities are taking money away from schools. Well, one could make the argument, too, that um, at least this process, although it needs some adjusting based on the grievances that you both mentioned today, um, does ensure that all who live in that community pay something towards the operation of municipal services, whether it be police, fire, or what have you, and that if we were to adopt your legislation, uh, they would no longer pay anything because if they're a tax-exempt entity, they don't pay any other kind of taxes. It just as the other 2,000 municipalities across the Commonwealth do. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, and finally, I noticed in your legislation that you would allow the municipality to um, ask how many adults live in a residence. Uh, what was the reason behind that uh, in terms of what you were trying to get at? I'm not, I'm not sure I have that particular piece of the, the legislation. If you could point me to a, a line on it, that would be appreciated. Let me see if I can dig that out. And if I don't have an answer, Mr. Chairman, I. I know my team members over there will get back to you with these things. It's in uh, section, it's on page six, and it's section E. Section B, Madam Chair, you said? E, e as in everything. <laughs> oh, yes, uh, the chair is correct. It's uh, line 16 through 19, adult occupants. Prior to providing a uh, utility service, a borough may require the applicant to provide the name of each adult occupant re uh, residing at the location and proof of their identity. I just wasn't clear why that requirement was in there. Yeah, I, I believe that that is, um, and, and I'm not trying to perjure myself. I'm going to go off on an I think type thing, <laughs> Madam Chair, if that's okay. That's good. Um, I, I think, Mr. Chairman, um, that that's information that was actually taken from the PUC. I believe that's part of that entire section. Um, but I, I will get back to you, and I think that that has to do with um, uh, down payments or uh, security deposits. So I'll, th I'll get back to you on that, but that seems to be in that overall section, but I can get back to you on it that. It just seems as a curious provision, because if you're paying your electric bill, why do 
why does the electric company or the borough need to know how many people are living there who are adults? It, yeah, I, once again, I think that that is the part, this is the part that was taken directly from the PUC piece. Um, so I think that we probably transferred that over, but I can get back to you with that information. That's fine. I, yeah, I Thank just you. know in my own case, paying my med ed bill, they've never asked me how many adults live in our household. So I found that kind of curious. Uh -huh. But thank you for your testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Representative Mahaffey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Bernstein, thank you for your uh, testimony. Uh, the question I have is, uh, I have a couple questions, and bear with me here, I'm losing my voice. Uh, if this bill is enacted in the law, when would it take place? Uh, we have that as... <laughs> 60 days. Okay. Representative Mahaffey. Now, I do represent two boroughs <clears throat> that do sell electric to their constituents, their customers. Yes. Uh, Middletown Borough and Royalton Borough. The question I have is, is as coming into this, I was previously a elected official at the local level. Mm -hmm. We run on a calendar year, as boroughs do also. If this is enacted within 60 days and that is taken out of their budget, how do you expect them to cover the difference? Now, in Middletown Borough, they, I think, move about $1.6 million over into their budget wow. from this. That's a considerable amount of money. You can make cuts, and there's no doubt about it. There's, you, can, you can make cuts, but the cuts you need to make are usually going to be services, and those services are usually police and public works. So if you don't have people out plowing your snow or making arrests or doing the, the protections that they need, I see this as being very problematic in this bill, if passed, because you cannot raise taxes in the middle of the year. That has to be identified and done at the end of the year, which would be enacted in the beginning of the year, and then that would be done through the taxation through the counties or, or the local tax collectors, whoever collects that money. So they can't collect any more tax revenue at that point, if need be. Uh, I know that this would be a, at least doubling these two municipalities in taxes if they had to cover this this difference other than cuts. But as you know, there's a lot of different ways that, that other municipalities across the state, first class municipalities have something called a business privilege tax. That taxes at a rate uh, at, of, on gross revenues. So you can talk about egregious and you can talk about you know people digging in and, and doing things in these local boroughs that you feel is hurting people, but if you go to other communities and other municipalities, every one of them has some kind of taxation, whether it be a business privilege tax, I'm just giving you for instance. So I'm just curious, what do you think about that and where, where do you think as far as that goes? Sure, I, I'd share with you, Representative Mahaffey, and thank you for coming today. Um, great to see you again. I would share with you that um, you know this is a type of thing that I'm willing to work on as we want to, if we want to extend this out. Um, that's something I'd be, I'd be willing to work with you on. As you talk about um, the tax rates, I think it's important to understand that there's also another component to this, and that's with property taxes, you have the opportunity to write these off. And with, um, when you talk about electric, you do not have the opportunity to deduct that from your taxes. Um, it looks to me, from my analysis of it, um, and you're talking to kind of a data nerd here um, that, that likes a lot of numbers. And my analysis is very simply that these 35 people, that these 35 municipalities are living pretty fat, living pretty good off the hog. And while they're doing it, um, they're doing it at the expense of taxpayers. And they're doing it at the expense of my constituents and other constituents across this Commonwealth. And I will tell you this, Mr. Representative Mahaffey, that whenever we hear the stories like Mr. Bush shared, and whenever we hear the stories of the 70-some-year-old woman that came into my office because they shut her electric off, and she came in to plug in her oxygen tank, she could live, not live well, not have heat, live, that this is the kind of thing that I'm willing to go to all costs to try to stop because we can't allow this to happen in our municipalities anymore. I I would, uh, I'd agree that any time that you have these problems where people are getting shut off in the middle of winter and so forth, and there's other things out there that we can uh, hopefully help them with, uh, I know the municipalities that I deal with and, and that I represent, 
uh, they go to great costs and great extent to try to help people like that. I don't know them the specific situation that you're talking about. I don't know if they went through a process, and I'd be willing to ask the same question to the other testifiers at that point in time. But I would hope they would not do that on the first go around. I hope it would be a, a situation where they've gone through every possible option out there before they do something of that sort. And I know that the general med eds and PPNLs and so forth, they do the same thing. You know, I think they've extended themselves to that point, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Whelan, we're, and uh, folks, we're gonna have to move this along so in order to be able to get all the testimony in today. So let's have shorter questions and shorter answers, okay? Absolutely, Madam Chair. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Representative, um, for bringing this to our attention. Uh, just a real quick question. Uh, we were presented with this uh, chart as part of the testimony. I'm not sure who, who provided it. It's uh, footnoted at the bottom, Pennsylvania DCED Municipal Statistic Database. Yep. Now, someone mentioned before the start of this hearing that perhaps this was not totally accurate. Right. Could you point out what's not accurate or have you not had the time to digest this? I, I can, Representative Whelan, and thank you for the question. And Madam Chair, I'll try to be short, but, but I wanna make sure that I answer the question. I think this is important. And when we have a testifier- Just for the members, um, I believe this came from the PMEA. They are scheduled to testify. So give your answer as to yep. why you believe it's inaccurate, but the members should keep an open mind till they hear from the PMEA, which yep. is coming up if we- Sure, I will share with you that all the information, um, and I have the documentation here of every county that was pulled for tax rates. The tax rates on here, of the 35 that are listed, there are seven inaccuracies. Those inaccuracies are at East Connemanaugh Borough, Royalton, Chambersburg, Wampum, Lansdale, Dunconian, Mifflinsburg, um, so the inaccuracies are, are clear on here. We have proof and documentation from the counties. Uh, I question when, if someone comes up and produces false information to the committee, um, I guess we'll have to hear what the rest of their testimony is. Representative Bernstein. The purpose of a hearing is to explore the bill. I understand that you take issue with the PMEA's chart. But if it came from DCED, there are a lot of possibilities for why your numbers and theirs vary. And I don't think we have to disparage people who have not yet testified on Thank that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Whelan, anything else? Thank you, Representative. All right, I have a question for Mr. Bush. Um, you live in and you own property in El Elwood City, right? That is correct. Okay, and you were told by several state representatives or state legislators that this was a local problem. That is correct. And you're here with the local government committee. So I guess I, I would like to hear from you what you did at the local level. Did you go down to Burr Hall, talk to your elected officials? What, <clears throat> what did you do to talk to your local government officials about the issues that you uh, told us about? Yes, thank you. Um, I would go to meetings um, and, and talk to the mayor. Um, one, one specific thing was uh, the, the borough, uh, if a tenant would not pay, they would hold the landlord accountable for the non-payment. Well, uh, they, they took one of my tenants and uh, applied a budget plan for him without my acknowledgement. When the tenant moved out, I was absorbed with a $900 um, electric bill. I had to pay that in order to get a um, new tenant in there. This was absurd. This was without my acknowledgement that they did this. So I went to council meetings to everything, then to state representative uh, Jared Gibbons, and he said there was nothing he could do. Um, I, I was dumbfounded on what I could do. All right, so you did try to talk to your Absolutely. local government? Okay. Absolutely. So that was actually my question because, um, because I understand that the purpose of making the owner of the property that got the electricity responsible for the bill. I've seen that elsewhere, and I don't think that that's an unusual provision. So you also talked about your tenants, and I'm assuming that as the landlord, that the only way that they would have an inability to pay their electric bill for electricity they had obviously consumed has to do with the fact that the rent that they pay you does not include utilities. Am I right about that? That is correct. Okay, thanks. 
You're welcome. Thank you very much for your testimony. We'll move on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Chairman. The next, uh, next up is Vance Oaks, president of the Pennsylvania Municipal Electric Association and the Borough of Grove, sit, Grove City Manager, and Robert Thompson, the Borough of Ephrata Manager. Gentlemen, consider yourself sworn, although I don't have a court reporter to take testimony, and this is an informational hearing, and I see Dave Waglam is also there. Dave, you wanna identify yourself to the committee because you're not on the list. Use the microphone, and you uh, turn it on by pressing the bottom of it. Get a little green light, and I'll let you go. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm David Waglam. I'm the Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Municipal Electric Association. Thanks. Do you guys have an order in which you want to go? Fine. Then I'm going to let you go. Whoever goes first, introduce yourself. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My, my name is uh, Vance. Sounds Oaks. like your mic is not on. You want to make sure that green light's lit? Closer. How's that? Closer. A little closer to your mouth. Yeah, that's closer. true. We want to hear you. Okay, Come on. thank you. I'm sorry about that. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, good morning again, Chairwoman Harper, Chairman Freeman, and committee members. Uh, my name is Vance Oaks, and I'm the borough manager for the borough of Grove City in Mercer County. And I'm also president of the Pennsylvania Municipal Electric Association. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to appear before you today and provide comments on the importance of municipal electric systems in Pennsylvania and on the negative effects House Bill 1405 would have on boroughs that operate municipal electric systems. Uh, nationwide, there are more than 2,000 public power systems that provide electricity to about 49 million Americans, accounting for 15% of all electric sales in the United States. Uh, some of the nation's largest cities, including Los Angeles, Orlando, Nashville, and Seattle, operate publicly owned electric utilities. However, the majority of public power communities are small, uh, with 3,000 or fewer customers. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, there are 35 such borough-owned electric utilities, serving approximately 165,000 Pennsylvanians. While the largest is Chambersburg Borough, serving more than 20,000 residents, the average Pennsylvania public power system serves a population of only 3,200 residents. Most, if not all, of the 35 municipal power systems in PA have been in the public power business for more than 100 years. Electric, uh, municipal electric systems are often referred to as public power, because the utilities are part of the local government. Uh, they're governed by the elected borough council. As a result, uh, in public power communities, the shareholders of the system and the customers are one and the same. This structure allows our electric system to be responsive to customer concerns and allows customers to speak directly to the borough council about policies and decisions that affects the municipal power system. So public power is directly accountable to voters. Our rates, our power supply plans, capital investments, policies and procedures are all discussed in an open and transparent process at borough council meetings and voted on by the elected borough council members. This public power format allows the borough council to focus on the long-term goals of our community and to deliver a competitively priced service with reliability that is aligned with community goals and sound business practices. Public power revenues are then reinvested in community programs and services and projects that are decided and directed by the people's representative. As nonprofit entities, municipal electric systems exist to provide reliable, affordable electric service to our customer owners. Pennsylvania's municipal electric systems and the rural electric cooperatives here in Pennsylvania are exempt from PUC regulation because they are self-regulated by their consumers. Pennsylvania's municipal electric systems are unique electric suppliers. As uh, local government entities, we face a, a public accountability and transparency that other suppliers do not. Our systems are subject to the open records law, the sunshine law, competitive bidding requirements, conflict of interest standards, prevailing wage laws, and investment restrictions. Um, as nonprofit entities, borough-owned electric systems prioritize reliable service. 
Uh, on average, uh, system outages for a borough-owned system are less frequent and resolve far uh, quicker than for state-regulated utilities. For typical operations, borough-owned electric utilities have an, an, uh, an average outage time of only 13 minutes, whereas state-regulated utilities uh, have an average outage time of 109 minutes. For uh, major adverse weather events that occur, borough-owned electric utilities have an average outage time of only 42 minutes, whereas state-regulated utilities have an outage time of 146 <coughs> minutes. Um, local control of rates and investment priorities, openness and transparency, public accountability and reliability and value to the community make public power a very good deal for the Pennsylvanians who live in the 35 communities that have public power. Unfortunately, House Bill 1405 would significantly and negatively change public power. This bill is the result of concerns raised in one borough, the borough of Elwood City in Western PA. Uh, over the last two years, some residents of Elwood City raised concerns uh, about how the borough was running their municipal electric system. And these concerns led a group of citizens last year to run for borough council on a platform of change to the operations of the borough's power system. On November 7th, two of the four candidates on the slate won. In fact, they were the top two vote getters and those backing change almost swept borough council. Uh, now that they've been elected, the new borough council members working with those incumbent council members are free to implement the policies and change the way Elwood City runs its electric system. In fact, I would say that we owe them the opportunity to do so. They can do this without affecting the unique operations of any other municipal system and without adopting a one-size-fits-all answer. Pennsylvania is a diverse and unique state. The Commonwealth has a long history of relying on local government to make important decisions and vesting power in local elected officials and local voters to determine what is best for their community. Because what is good in Elwood City it may not be what is best for Kutztown or Lansdale. House Bill 1405 disrupts this time-honored tradition in Pennsylvania, and it is directing from Harrisburg what is good for all 35 boroughs who have public power disregarding the will of the voters. I've been involved with local government my whole career, and I know that decisions made at the local level uh, better address local priorities and local concerns. I would urge the committee to reject House Bill 1405 and allow public power to continue to be a good deal for Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear from the panel before we take questions. Thanks. Stick around. <laughs> good morning, Chairman, <clears throat> excuse me, Chairwoman Harper, Chairman Freeman, and committee members. I'm Robert Thompson, Borough Manager in Ephrata, Lancaster County. I want to thank my friend Vance Oaks for providing an overview of municipal power and how our electric systems are different from investor-owned utilities <coughs> or IOUs. I focus my comments for today's hearing on the practical effects of House Bill 1405, <coughs> specifically what House Bill 1405, if approved into law, would do to municipal budgets and the drastic changes in operations House Bill 1405 will force upon the 35 boroughs with public power. In 1902, Ephrata purchased a steam generator for $7,000 to supply the borough with electricity and has remained in the electric business since. Ephrata is the largest borough in Lancaster County with a population of 13,394. As of the last tax year, 2017, Ephrata Borough had the lowest real estate tax of any borough in the county at 2.28 mills. We have no general fund debt and yet we offer extensive municipal services including police, public works, sanitation, water, sewer services, and great quality of life amenities. In 2017, the borough transferred $1,523,544 from the electric fund to the general fund. This payment in lieu of taxes or pilot by Ephrata electric system amounts to 13% of the borough's 2017 general fund budget. This policy is not unique. In fact, most of the 2,000 municipalities across the country are, that are served by municipal electric have pilots. 
Our borough council supports the policy of lower real estate tax rates over lower electric rates because customers can impact what they pay for electricity through conservation practices and the payment from a municipal electric system broadens the revenue base to make sure that even not pro non for profit entities do, do not pay, who do not pay real estate taxes provide some revenue to the borough for the services that they receive. This policy decision is local, made by elected representatives of Ephrata. If the policy is not working, I'm sure the voters of Ephrata would elect new council members to change the policy. If House Bill 1405 was law and a pilot or transfer from the electric fund was prohibited in 2017, we would need to increase real estate taxes from 2.28 mills to 6.68 mills, or an average of $696 per household to make up the shortfall. Under a full repeal of the pilot, a typical residential uh, electric customer using 1,000 kilowatt hours per month would see a decrease of only $263 per year in their electric bill. The Pennsylvania Municipal Electric Association has projected that the average real estate tax increase for the 35 municipalities as a result of the full implementation of House Bill 1405 would be 390, or excuse me, 379%. Ending the pilot as proposed in House Bill 1405 is a bad deal for effort of taxpayers and a bad deal for other taxpayers served by municipal power. The Pennsylvania Municipal Electric Association has provided the committee with an analysis of the property tax rate in the 35 boroughs that have municipal electric system compared to the average property tax in the boroughs in their home county. That analysis shows that the property taxes in municipal electric boroughs are on average 42.5% lower than property taxes in other boroughs in their county. We know that property tax reform or property tax elimination is a key legislative issue and one that has significant discussion in this chamber. House, 1405, House Bill 1405 goes in the opposite direction, requiring boroughs with municipal electric companies to implement huge tax increases. This bill shifts the burden of revenue generation in our 35 boroughs from a mix of property taxes and electric company pilot to sole reliance on property taxes. As I stated previously in Ephrata, property taxes would increase by $696 per year, while the average residential customer would see a reduction in electric rate charges of only $263. A recent report by Pennsylvania Independent Fiscal Office found that statewide, 43.8% of all homestead property tax money is paid by those 60 and older. So one of the results of House Bill 1405 will be to worsen the unfair burden of property taxes facing Pennsylvania senior citizens. Shifting to a full reliance on real estate taxes will not only hit the elderly hard, but it will most likely lead to the 35 boroughs who are served by Municipal Electric to reduce expenditures and harm the borough's ability to provide excuse me, basic services such as police, fire, and public works. It will have a more drastic effect on quality of life attributes that citizens enjoy, especially those in Ephrata. These include Lancaster County's most popular public library, the Sheridan Bigler Theater for the Effort of Performing Arts Center, a first class community pool, the Warwick to Effort of Rail Trail, the Whistle Stop Plaza, the Effort of Recreation Center, and the development of a central business district infrastructure to, which serves to, to attract and retain businesses. Over the last year, legislators in Harrisburg worked hard to approve the state budget that does not include broad-based taxes, such as personal income taxes, corporate net income taxes, and sales taxes. This year, the State House voted to transfer unused funds from programs in order to balance the Commonwealth's budget and avoid tax increases. We understand how important it is to keep broad-based taxes low, and that's why we use a mix of property taxes and municipal electric pilot to keep our taxes low. Some supporters of House Bill 1405 argue that electric rates for municipal power are much higher than the rates of the IOU in the neighboring communities, because municipal electric rates partially support the borough's general fund budget. While that, <clears throat> excuse me, while that might be the case in some communities, it varies across the Commonwealth. I can only speak for Ephrata, and electric rates in Ephrata are lower than the surround, surrounding IOU PPL. 
For a typical residential customer using 1,000 kilowatt hours per month, the cost of electricity in the borough is $127.45. A PPL customer using the same 1,000 kilowatt hours per month who lives outside the borough would pay $148.56. Finally, last fall and over the winter, there's been some discussion by supporters of House Bill 1405 of amending the bill to make it only affect Elwood City and carve out the other 34 municipal electric systems. I strongly urge you to reject this proposal. We have a borough code, so there is one set of rules for all boroughs. This is similar for cities and townships. It sets a bad precedent to make public policy to change the rules for one community, and our concern would be for future targeted legislative action to resolve complaints of a few citizens. House Bill 1405 is not needed, and if implemented, will only lead to increased property taxes, reduced municipal services, and greater problems running a borough that has a municipal electric system. Simply put, if it's not broke, don't fix it. I urge you to reject House Bill 1405. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Dave, do you have testimony or anything you want to add? You're no, I'm just here to answer questions, should they come. Okay, I'm sure we will have some questions. I want to mention, I forgot to do this earlier, Representative Hill Evans of York County uh, has joined us. Sorry about that. Saw you forgot to say it, okay? Um, now, do we have uh, questions? Yes. Chairman Freeman? Thank you, Madam Chair. And gentlemen, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, it seems clear from your testimony that one of the effects of this legislation could be that property taxes increase greatly in those boroughs that currently have electrical systems or provide electricity. Um, and Mr. Thompson, you mentioned that it would go in, in your community from a millage of two to about six. Is that That's correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, you also mentioned that um, your electrical generation produces a cheaper form of electricity than PPNL, which services communities outside of effort. Is that correct? Uh, our rates are lower. We do not generate any power. We right, purchase sorry. power, but the, our portfolio consists of products that allow our generation to be less, yes. So in selecting your providers, you obviously must have some cost savings that goes into that in order to offer a cheaper. That's cheaper. correct. Okay. Um, in terms of your organization, too, um, does it provide guidelines to participating municipalities in terms of how to deal with issues uh, such as uh, pertaining to rate settings and consumer protection issues? That is correct, we do. Uh, the PMEA, a number of years ago, developed a um, standards of good practice uh, operating procedures for our membership, and we've provided them with some guidelines on uh, issues dealing with uh, terminations that were mentioned today, and a whole host of other things related to the operation of a municipal electric system. And would you happen to know offhand how many of the 35 municipalities pretty much follow those guidelines? I, I'm sorry, I, I don't. We could get you that information, okay, though. Okay, that, that would be helpful. And my Fine, last you can submit it to my office and I'll circulate it to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Chair. My, my final question, too. Um, I know one of the issues with Elwood City was the rapid fluctuation of rates. What is the norm in the other municipalities that, that provide this kind of service? In, in Effort of Borough, we have a, uh, a fixed rate for various classes of customer, and there is one item called a power cost adjustment, and the power cost adjustment allows us to pass on the cost of the, of the to generate the energy uh, for the products that we purchase. So if, if it's a natural gas generator, if natural gas goes up, the cost of generating that power goes up as well. Uh, what, what you don't typically hear, however, is that when the cost of the power or the fossil fuels to generate go down, we pass on the credits as well. And I believe in, uh, we've, given, we've given back in the last several years in excess of uh, uh, $200,000. That's a considerable sum. Uh, and finally, I'd ask uh, of the prime sponsor, uh, in his legislation, if a municipality would choose not to follow the guidelines that he's setting out in the legislation, they could follow the guidelines set out by the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland interconnection. Could you enlighten us as to what that organization is and what they do? Are you familiar with them? Mm -hmm. okay. um, uh, PJM basically regulates the grid, uh, the, the distribution system, the transmission system, the wires that uh, the energy passes over into Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland. Um, they actually have various uh, uh, levies, if you will, or tariffs, or uh, they do auctions and they, they control the cost of energy through the grid, grid system. Um, typically, 
in uh, when you talk about one of the things we talked about was energy choice today. Uh, those uh, that take advantage of energy choice only have uh, are taking energy choice for generation of power. The distribution system and the transmission costs are not regulated by the generator and therefore they're generally fixed and they're the costs that you generally see go up faster. In our comparison with PP&L, uh, while the cost to, uh, to compare for generation might be a little lower than the boroughs, their distribution costs are significantly higher and the customer does not have any control over the distribution cost, they only have control over the electric generation costs. That's a very good point to make, thank you. Um, I guess that concludes my uh, questions, thank you. Okay, um, whoops, I think uh, Representative Diamond, you were next, right? I'm up at some, some point, sorry, put me on you. at some point. Put me okay, on. we'll go to Representative Day next because I missed him on the last round, but Representative Diamond, you have the floor. Okay, go ahead. thank you. Uh, of the <clears throat> roughly three dozen boroughs here, how many of them actually generate their own electricity and how many of them are purchasing it from another generator and reselling it? Uh, there are no members of PMEA, none of the 35, that generate 100% of their electricity needs for their consumers. Um, Chambersburg and the borough of Berlin, they own generation assets and they can operate those when needed, but they do not supply 100% of the base load needs of their community. So nobody solely generates their own electricity that is as correct. far as a borough? Correct. Okay, okay. And, and that gives me concern and why part of the way, reason why I'm a supporter of this bill is because I believe every Pennsylvania should be able to have choice. I know we don't have this kind of system in my township, but we do have a not monopoly on cable TV, which I absolutely hate. Um, so I understand the logic there. I wanted to ask you, do you have any figures, uh, Mr. Oaks, on <clears throat> when everybody touched on property taxes, I can see that the base of the ratepayers is larger than the base of property taxpayers due to nonprofits, that sort of thing. Do you have any figures you could submit to the committee of, uh, in these boroughs, how many of the ratepayers are not paying property taxes? Could you prepare that and submit that to the committee? I'm sure that that is something we could provide. I don't have that information today. Okay. Um, I could tell you in my hometown in Grove City Borough, we're the home of Grove City College and uh, we're the home of the local school district as well. Right. So we see more than 60% of the real estate in our borough as being tax exempt. Okay. Whereas those utilities are, are provided to those entities. Yeah, I, I think those would be important figures for the committee to see before we uh, take further action on this. And, and just one more comment on the property tax, because you both mentioned it. Uh, for me, who uh, I'm a complete supporter of the total elimination of property tax, um, your arguments may push me a different way than you think because I see some of the members of these communities who may not be on my bandwagon yet, and I may want to make it worse for them so that they get on my bandwagon to eliminate property taxes. So well, thank be you careful for being when so you push honest, that. Representative Diamond. <laughs> well, honest, Representative Well, it's like, you know, we've been trying to get support for that, and, and here you're giving me a reason to vote for a bill that might add to the support for that. So be careful how you push that issue. And be careful what you wish for, Representative Diamond. <laughs> okay, Representative Day. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, I have two questions. One for the first one for this panel. <clears throat> There's a general idea that government fees are associated with the cost of the services provided for those fees. And this allows for government costs to be uh, examined, compared, scrutinized by the public. You know, generally I support this bill because for transparency and it forces clear delineation between the funds and what the funds are used for, which I think is a good practice. Uh, you know, I think that the argument of, well, this will drive up property taxes, yeah, that's a bad political argument to have and everything, but we make policy, and the policy should be clear transparency so the people can then go to the local uh, municipalities, participate in the public discourse, and know exactly what the comparisons are, what the metrics are. There's no doubt in my mind that we have a role to play here. 
uh, by setting the rules for the use of funds between the general fund and the electric fund, I think it's good policy is where I'm coming from. I think it's important that I share that with you and everyone here. Mixing both funds as a way to tax businesses and other electric rate payers uh, to lower the municipal tax burden to residents is something that is politically pleasing and, and something that if I was the manager, I'd probably be looking to do as well if I had the ability to do that. But it's something that we should definitely in the legislature make a policy on this with our eyes open. So I wanna just ask you my question that I need to get from you is, do you think municipalities should be totally unfettered in the transfer of funds between, um, um, the transfer of monies between two different funds? Do you think it should be like, um, you know, in my next question you're gonna see, I'm gonna ask Representative Bernstein about, you know, if I use a municipal employee to provide electric, ser electric service, I think there should be a small transfer of funds for that purpose uh, with an administrative fund for your, you know, your management of both maybe or, or as a manager. But when all of a sudden at the end of the year, we decide we wanna have a parade and we wanna spend $150,000, where are we gonna go grab it from? That's what I wanna kinda of rein in. So I'll go back to my question. Do you think municipalities should be unfettered, transfer as much as they want from one fund to the other. Uh, Representative, is your question, do you think municipalities, which are subject to the Sunshine Act, the Right to Know Law, the Borough Code, and a million other laws, should be unfettered within those guidelines? Because they're obviously not unfettered. They, don't, they do nothing unfettered to the best of my knowledge. So is that your question? Madam Chair, I would appreciate the opportunity to question the people at this public okay. hearing they can without answer a that? defense attorney framing my question. Right. They can answer that, but I think that we're the local government committee. If we don't understand local government, that's a problem. And this is an amendment to the borough code, okay, which is, uh, is the guiding document for the boroughs. You can answer the question, but let's have fair questions here in view of the fact that we know that local governments are regulated by several statutes and they are not unfettered in anything they do. Somebody wanna answer that question? So we believe that the current system um, results in local decisions being made by local officials. Whether it's rates, whether it's what streets to resurface, how many policemen to have, whichever the case. Um, so we don't believe we're unfettered. Uh, and in fact, while, our, while there are many practices that are very common amongst our 35, there are some of them that take divergent paths. For instance, three of our municipalities do not make any transfer from the electric to the general fund. Three different municipalities have no real estate tax. So these are all local decisions being made by local officials, and our position is that um, Pennsylvania is all about local government and decentralized decision making. And this leaves all of these decisions to be made by local people who live and obviously govern in each of these local municipalities. Um, Thank and you, I, I appreciate your answer. Thank you very much. Representative Bernstein, I wanted to ask you another question. You know, borough electric companies are better uh, in provisioning of these services. They're uh, helpful in a borough in my district. The borough, I believe, should be allowed to charge the electric fund for services that borough employees provide uh, to the electric service and vice versa. If, if, if you use an electric service person for borough activity, I think you should be able to transfer that either way, plus an administrative fee, four to seven percent, plus just another four or seven percent. But I support you in what you're trying to do uh, with large amounts being transferred back and forth uh, with, with my definition of unfettered not the definition uh, uh, redirected by our chair and the answer, you guys obviously have a different. So Representative Bernstein, would you agree that some reasonable charges be allowed to be charged from one fund to the other? Thank you, Representative, they are. Um, and the way that our legislation is written, 
I can't look at you and talk, so because yeah, it's fine. taken away. So uh, the way that our legislation is written is is very clear in the manner that should there be an employee, for example, that works for the borough and then works for the electric, um, you could charge for that particular employee. So um, any any fees or anything associated whatsoever with the electric company, um, that that would be able to. Um, I'm, I'm going to use the word write off. It's not how it's written in the language, but write off. And the fact that you're just not allowed to transfer the profit. Those electric municipal monopolies are not allowed to have a profit out of that, and that's what we're trying to what stop. What would you do with the profit? Would you require a reduction in rates? It is uh, correct. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. <coughs> Representative uh, Miller? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your testimony. Uh, a couple of quick questions. The, the, um, the electrical component that you have as part of your municipalities, is that similar to an authority, like a sewer authority that's kind of spun off, or is that a considered like a department within your respective boroughs? In Effort of Borough, we have a specific electric fund. So the charges and uh, expenditures for electric service go into the fund. Uh, the pilot is the single transfer that uh, transfers from electric fund to the general fund. Um, so I don't know if that... So d does the electrical component have any employees? Yes, the elect we have our own employees. And uh, the other piece of that is when you look at the transfer is the, it's the same customer base within the electric division as the general fund or the geographic boundaries of the borough. Uh, in many cases, water and sewer authorities, the customer base extends beyond the municipal boundary and then you start commingling uh, uh, revenues from customers that are from the borough and outside the borough. So that's why uh, we restrict the transfers only from the electric fund to the general fund. And in your organizational flow chart, are you the manager over the employees of the electrical component? Uh, ultimately, yes. We have an electric division with an electric division manager who supervises uh, linemen. So we operate and maintain our own electric distribution system as well as we have a power supply manager. Okay. And final question, if uh, for both of your boroughs, and maybe you can speak more broadly, um, if, if this bill were to be enacted and uh, the boroughs had to switch out to what most municipalities have. Would your respective bottom line budget number change? It just be, a, uh, or would it be a, a different pot of where the money comes from? Uh, as far as the total budget, um, we go through a fairly extensive. Uh, uh, a vetting process when we do our budget and we believe that uh, we have a very responsible budget and it, it is uh, uh, it's as low as it should be for the services that we provide. Now with that said is can you lower expenditures? You can do so by lowering uh, uh, service levels. You can do so by eliminating employees uh, or lowering um, on, on the uh, general fund side, approximately 75 to 76% of all expenditures are personnel related. So there, that really reduces down to about 25% of materials and supplies and outside services that you can have significant impacts. And over the years, those have gone uh, down to what we believe to be minimum levels for the service levels in our community. So um, forgive me a follow-up question then. So if, if for instance, uh, you have I'm making a guess here, 10 employees in the electric division, and this law were to be passed and you would have to divest uh, those employees and all. Your overall budget number, uh, let's say it's $20 million for the borough or whatever, could potentially be the same or lower. Um, we would probably not divest ourselves of the electric division employees. It would more be general fund employees would be impacted because the real estate tax rate would go up, general fund expense, uh, costs would go up, and we would be re looking to reduce the general fund, not the electric fund. Okay, thank you very much. Representative Whelan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. Uh, history tends to teach us a lot. I'm a firm believer in looking back in history. So if we look back in history, there's, uh, Present day, there's 35 boroughs. What was it previously? What did the Commonwealth peak out 
as boroughs or municipalities that maintain their own electric. Any any idea historically? To my knowledge, it's to my knowledge, it's always been 35. So it's been 35. I don't think it ever got higher. Never got higher. No. Um, and then the second and last question is, if this is such a good deal for for the folks in these boroughs, which in some cases, if we had an if this is accurate, it is a good deal for constituents in certain boroughs and maybe not so good for other boroughs. How many boroughs are, are looking at doing like these 35? Is there boroughs out there looking to do their own electrical? It would be very, very expensive for any municipality not currently in the public power business to get into the public power business. First of all, the, the, there would be a major expense at the entry point where the public power would come into the municipal line. The municipality would have to acquire, buy the poles and transformers hardware, the meters, Understood. from the IOU. So there would be a huge upfront cost. The municipality could borrow that, spread it out over 30 years, et cetera. But it would be very, very expensive now to get into the business. We basically, since the invention of electricity, we've always had 35 boroughs, right. basically. And nobody's looking to get into the business, and nobody's looking to get out. Correct. I mean, the, 30, okay. the 35 of these municipalities, as Mr. Oak said, all got into this at the turn of the century, around 1900, when power first became available. Okay. Their elected people had the wisdom okay. to get into this business, and they've stayed in the business. Thank you. Representative Mahaffey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, quick question. Do we have any other boroughs out of the 35 that have the same problem that El Elmwood, City, Elmwood City has? Or Elwood Borough, sorry. Is there anybody out there that's having this, this same problem? We are not aware of any concerns such as what we're hearing about Elwood City at this point. No. Okay. And a quick question, if you can be very quick with this, is... How did they get into this problem, and what have you done as your organization to help them get out of this problem? So borough officials first spoke to me as the association president uh, over a year ago about the problem. Um, Elwood City has a, rate, a retail rate structure that varies. As Mr. Thompson said previously, they have what's called a power adjustment factor uh, that changes. Um, Mr. Bernstein made reference earlier to a greatly fluctuating retail rate. Um, so as we worked, as I worked with Elwood City to help them, we put together some statistical information just to see what this varying retail rate structure was. And in fact, over a three-year period, the most recent three-year period, the retail rates fluctuated only 31%. However, the vast majority of that 30% came during what's called a polar vortex, polar vortex period of only three months, which took place about a year and a half ago. So one of the things that Elwood City did in response to this concern that some of their constituents had was approximately six months ago, they fixed their electric rate. When I say fixed, it made it steady. So this power adjustment factor went away. It remained the same. So for the past six months, there hasn't been any fluctuation in the retail rates in Elwood City. It's the same. So you know, our argument here is these are local decisions being made by local people concerning local issues. In Elwood City, there was this concern, which Borough Council heard from some of their constituents. And in response to that, um, they reacted and changed their rate structure so that there wouldn't be any kind of a fluctuation. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Bernstein, has something you wanted to say? Yeah, yeah, a couple, and I'll play rapid fire, so quick answer, quick, uh, if I could. First and foremost, the information on the taxes that was here. Um, from my understanding, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in it, and I would, uh, I would refer you to a, 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 the facts are stubborn, but statistics are more pliable by Mark Twain, okay? And, and I don't mind, um, but I want to point you to a couple quick things. Pitt, Pitt Karen, and by the way, I probably totally botched that, so pardon me. Um, is that right? Not bad. Not bad for a Western PA guy. Variance from county average, 2.91%, just over county average. Not bad, right, folks? Not too bad. Uh, in fact... 131 municipalities in Allegheny County. 
these folks have the 27th highest tax rate. We can go down to Middletown, 13% lower than the average. Well, folks, once again, those stubborn facts, 40 municipalities in Dauphin County, they're ranked ninth, happy to be in the top 25%. Um, we'll go down to Wattstown Borough, 5.35% higher, not too bad, but in fact, they have another good ranking of eighth of 36th in the highest tax rate. My point is, folks, the pliable figures that are here and what has been done by this is inaccurate and it's deceptive and it's unfortunate. The other thing that I would share with you is this. We have right here is we see the municipal rate comparison. Now, the interesting piece about this is, from my understanding and my analysis, this documentation is right, so I appreciate you providing accurate information, but here's what I find extremely troublesome. And if I could, I will address um, just the, uh, the gross city piece, if I could. So $143 to $131, not a significantly amount of higher rate, but that's a little bit more, right? Um, but here's the part that's interesting. That is if you do not have supplier choice. That may not seem like a significant amount of money. That's 9.2%, but the truth is, sir, if they utilize supplier choice, it's 27.8% higher that they would have on the open market. So I have one simple question for you. In your borough, sir, what else do you ask your residents to pay a 27.8% higher premium for? Gasoline, food, water, transportation? What else do you ask people to pay a higher rate for? Representative. Well, a little decorum and respect for people who have traveled long distances to testify today would be in order for any member of this committee at a hearing. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question was very simply, the information provided, I was curious to know, is they believe that it's acceptable to pay a 27.8% rate higher. I was curious to know what other factors. is argumentative. I will allow the gentleman to answer it and we will move on. Please answer. Thank you, if I may. Um, in regard to the statistics, um, I personally am the gentleman that put this report together for the committee. And I would invite you, if you go to the DCED's website, we could take out our smartphone and do this right now. Um, local government statistics are available. I downloaded an Excel spreadsheet and um, parceled out from that spreadsheet all boroughs in all counties in Pennsylvania. And I actually have a printout copy of that. If you would like to share that with the committee members, I'll make it available to you. Um, those are the facts. Thank um, you. If you'll, if you'll give that printout to me, I'll make sure the committee gets it. Certainly. And thank you for your testimony. Now we'll be moving on because we have a schedule to keep and we're behind schedule. Next up, Patrick Cicero from the Pennsylvania Utility Law Project and Beverly Anarumo, president of Elwood City Hospital. I know Patrick Cicero is here because I saw him earlier. Is, um, is the uh, president of the hospital here? Oh, there you are. Please take a seat. Thank you. Good morning. They're operations directors. Okay. Is there someone else who wants to testify as part of this panel? Could you identify yourself, sir? Thank you, Gerald Sanilo. Please have a seat. Do you guys have an order for your panel? Whatever pleases the, the committee. Whatever gets it done quickly and efficiently would be my bet. So why don't you go, Patrick, because you look ready. Sounds great, I am ready. Thank you, uh, Chairpersons Harper and Freeman and members of the House Local Government Committee. Also, I wanna thank you and Representative Bernstein for inviting me to testify today about House Bill 1405. You have in your packets uh, my written testimony. I'm going to summarize that. I'm not going to go through it um, in great detail. We've heard a lot of uh, conversation today about section one of the uh, legislation in House Bill 1405. Most of my testimony is gonna be about section two. Um, and section two of that legislation are consumer protections um, that would look to replicate some of the consumer protections that exist under the public utility code. And I think that they're pretty important and I'm gonna to talk to you about why they are um, and hopefully be able to answer any questions you have about those consumer protections. So I am the executive director of the Pennsylvania Utility Law Project, or PULP. 
PULP is a designated statewide specialty project of the Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network, focused exclusively on low-income utility issues. For almost four decades, our organization has provided legal representation and support, information consultation and advocacy in conjunction with local legal aid and community-based organizations. We represent clients before the Public Utility Commission, before the Department of Community and Economic Development, and the Department of Human Services on all matter of utility issues. Much of our advocacy focuses on energy issues because the ability of low-income Pennsylvanians to connect to and maintain essential services, including heat and light, is an ongoing concern. Others today have testified about the importance of flexibility on the parts of municipalities in setting rates. I understand the need for such flexibility. Today, however, I want to talk to you about the needs of low-income electric consumers who have to pay rates they often, some t they often cannot afford. Each year, we represent hundreds of low-income households facing the loss of critical utility service. Some of these households receive electric service from municipal, the 35 municipal electric uh, utilities. Unfailingly, these are among the most difficult cases for us to handle because of the lack of statutory and regulatory protections for these uh, consumers. When we are unable to adequately resolve municipal electric issues, our, our clients often face drastic choices. The costly and devastating eviction, foreclosure, and even child dependency proceedings because of loss of electric services. The consequences of the loss of a utility are far more significant and far more pervasive than simply having the lights out. The list of consumer protections provided in House Bill 1405 would go a long way in terms of ensuring that households receiving service from a municipal utility have the tools needed to maintain service during economically vulnerable periods. It is important for the committee to recognize that low-income households face burdens when they're required to purchase electricity. Unlike electricity provided by public utilities regulated by the Public Utility Commission, municipal electric providers do not generally have low-income rates or programs designed to help utility, uh, utility consumers and low-income consumers reduce their electric bills. These households also do not receive the benefit of well-developed regulatory and statutory protections and the ability to dispute um, to have their dispute determined by a neutral third party. Despite this, low-income households receive, served by municipal utilities face the same affordability problems. I would point you to chart one on page three of my written testimony, which lists the energy burdens of Pennsylvania households. This information is gathered annually, and what it shows is that there are about 300,000 Pennsylvania households who live in what's called deep poverty. Deep poverty is defined as um, households living below 50% of the federal poverty guidelines. To give you a sense of context, the 2016 federal poverty income guidelines, and I'm using 2016 because the data, uh, the energy burden data I have is 2016 data, um, is about $12,000 for a family of four. There are 300,000 households in our commonwealth who live below that level. You can see there are about a million and a half Pennsylvania households, and that represents about four million people, or 25% or so of our uh, Commonwealth, that live below 200% of the federal poverty guidelines. These households always pay a significant portion of their monthly income for energy. Chart two on page four gives you some of those uh, federal poverty levels to give you context about what we're, uh, what we're talking about. Pennsylvanians with income at or below these thresholds are very poor and struggle monthly. Unlike other goods and services, there is no ready substitute for electricity. When families cannot pay, they are simply forced to go without service for, for periods of time. And the consequences that I spoke of earlier often befall these households. Living without electric service is more than an inconvenience. Lack of refrigeration causes food to spoil. Families cannot cook hot meals or take hot showers. And most often, furnaces are not operational, even if they run on an alternative fuel, such as oil or natural gas. House Bill 1405 is no panacea, but it is a start. In reviewing the legislation as it is currently constructed, there are several changes that should be made, I believe, to clarify certain intent. I list those changes in my written testimony and won't belabor them here. Um, they deal with uh, uh, carrying over some language um, from Title 66, which is the public utility code that isn't necessarily applicable um, to municipal utilities. And so if you look at my uh, written testimony, you'll see some of the changes um, that I believe would be necessary. The only one I want to specifically talk about um, in my uh, oral remarks um, is on page seven and lines three through four. 
Here, uh, this would require the municipality to enter into um, at least one payment agreement with the household. I believe the intent should be clarified. Uh, currently, the language says the borough may enter into a payment agree agreement. I think it is critical for households to have second chances. Because of the nature of poverty, households often have to juggle their bills each month. They cannot always pay every bill on time and in full. If a customer falls behind on their electric bill, they should provide it a reasonable period of time to catch up. I would suggest that the may be, uh, be changed to shall, um, so that boroughs, like other utilities, shall provide at least one opportunity for a second chance. I know that some members of the committee are concerned about the impact of House Bill 1405 on the ability to generate revenue for other municipal functions. I am not insensitive to concerns of municipalities in managing their revenue streams to provide needed services for their constituents. It is important to remember, however, that electricity rates, unlike, say, property taxes, are typically regressive in nature. That is, poor households pay the same rate per kilowatt hour as wealthy households and middle income households, but do so with far less income. Property taxes tend to be measured based on the value of homes. Um, those with uh, more expensive homes tend to pay more than those with less expensive homes. Furthermore, there is no ready substitute for a household to do without electricity. Every rate design and rate mechanism comes with positive and negative attributes in terms of bill impacts, revenue, and public interest concerns. Utilities and municipalities often seek rate designs that re and rate recovery mechanisms that guarantee recovery of costs uh, to meet other needs, but rarely do they recognize the need for assistance programs that are designed to help economically vulnerable households. House Bill 1405 appears targeted to ensure that utilities have the revenue needed for the public service provided. With the additional consumer protections contained in Section 2, as amended, um, or the su suggestions of amendment contained in my written testimony, we believe that the bill goes a long way in leveling the playing field for low and moderate income households. And with the corrections suggested here, we believe it should be adopted by the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and provide this information. I am available to entertain questions that the uh, committee may have after my fellow panel members have an opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Next. Hi. Uh, I'm Beverly Anarumo. I'm the CEO of Elwood City Hospital. Um, we were a not-for-profit hospital for greater than 100 years. We were just recently sold and are for-profit now, so we will be paying taxes. Um, what I'm hearing today, um, I can only speak from our side of it. We pay, on average, about $40,000 a month for our electric bill. If we take the figures that we are about 25% higher because we can't shop our power out to another source, we're paying about $120,000 a year more than what we really should. I look at that in terms of what could I do with $120,000 to help my community. You know, we offer a Meals on Wheels program. Uh, we service about 50 elderly folks. We do that through a volunteer program. We have 60 and 70 year olds out there trying to help feed the 80 and 90 year olds. With $120,000, I could hire a couple people and quadruple um, what I could do with that type of money. Um, you know, we could upgrade. We have a system where we have a help for elderly. They push a button, they get help. <clears throat> we could upgrade our system and offer that to more folks. Um, you know, I also look at it from the perspective of if what uh, Representative Bernstein said is true about our police department, you know, my folks that I work with, they haven't had wage scale adjustments in greater than 10 years because we as a nonprofit hospital couldn't afford it. Um, you know, and they're making these large amounts of money. Um, the last thing that I heard today, and it just hit me while I was sitting here, is that, you know, hospitals and schools were made nonprofits for a reason. By government regulations, they became nonprofits. It sounds to me like these municipalities are finding a way around what the government said was a nonprofit for whatever reason they became a nonprofit to tax them anyways. It just seems like it's kind of not fair. They were nonprofit for a reason and you're taxing them a roundabout way. So um, yeah. Uh, I'm going to start off with a question because I'm curious. Uh, if you're now a for-profit hospital, do you know what your taxes will be? Uh, we just got our tax bill. Oh, we just got it. We just became yeah, you would have gotten your October. borough and county taxes. We did not receive our. 
borough, borough bill yet. We received our county taxes so far. So do you have any idea what your borough taxes will be now that you're for profit? No, we have, we don't know, but what, I, what I've heard is gonna be around 90,000 just for the hospital building. Okay, so you'll be paying, um, and that's just borough taxes and your school taxes are likely to be They're probably much gonna, higher probably than Probably gonna that. be more, the, the, the um, county taxes around 88,000 from what I saw. Okay, and as a nonprofit, you consume the electricity that you paid for, right? I mean, hospitals are big users of electricity, right? Yes. Okay, so you're supporting uh, Representative Bernstein's bill because you would like the ability even if your taxes will greatly increase mm -hmm. to save money on electricity. Yes, and here's why. Because okay. of the fluctuation, we <clears throat> never know where our bill is gonna be. At least with taxes, we can write them off and we know what our bill is gonna be. It, it is, there's not every month it's gonna be a different amount of money. Right, okay, I'm looking at your controller. You're the controller, right? No, I'm no. not. I'm the oh. facilities director. Okay, because it was my understanding that the cost of doing business for a hospital would include your electric. True. Yes. yes, we are regulated, though. I mean, you know, we are, again, a not-for-profit for a reason, I think. And Well, you're not a not-for-profit. You we, are for-profit at the moment, we are. right? Yes, we okay. are now. But not-for-profits are made not-for-profit for a reason right. I, because you're mandated to keep within certain guidelines, that kind of thing. But we are, we are using our electricity. Right, okay. So I guess what I'm asking is, the trade-off you're asking us for is, we're willing to pay much higher property taxes as long as we get a $120,000 break, we believe, on our electricity. We can also write those taxes off. And you, okay. So I see where you're coming from, although I'm not sure about the electricity as a cost of doing business. But that, that's that's the IRS and not something I'm involved in. Any other questions? No Chairman Freeman. Given the, the nature of the electric bill you've cited, about 40000 a month, mm -hmm. have you instituted any conservation measures? And if so, what are those? Uh, I can um, let Charlie speak to that. Um, uh, yes, sir. We, um, we, have, we have looked at doing some conservation measures, of course. I, I think in, um, well, in our past, and even, even currently, we're, we're still not a really um, really on the positive end of doing things. We've looked at measures to reduce energy. We looked at changing our lighting systems out. We looked at variable speed drives on equipment. We looked at new equipment. The problem is we can't afford it, or we couldn't afford it at the time. We're, um, <clears throat> we're kind of lost with, we, we don't have that competitive advantage we felt too with purchasing of power. Um, being locked into one power grid, one power system, we couldn't shop like you would typically shop for. No, I understand electric. that, but obviously you could save some money through we, the we could. implementation of conservation. We, we could do that if, if, if we had the finances so, to do that. Yes, sir, we would do that. At this point, you've looked at it, but you haven't implemented any. So I know that Charlie, uh, I'm sorry, I'm fairly new to the CEO, ro CEO role at the hospital, but I know in the past Charlie has gone to the borough and asked them for help. You know, other communities have had Penn Power or whatever be able to go in and help with lighting, changing out light bulbs to more efficient lighting systems. We don't have that advantage. Charlie, you there, can speak There was to the Act, Act 129, I believe. It was um, where the, um, the, the energy provider would help and assist the consumer with change out of light systems. Sure, um, I'll those right. the chair. So, so let me go back to your, your statement. Did you go to the borough and ask them for a special rate? Many boroughs that, that uh, generate electricity or, or sell electricity have special rates for big users who are also big employers and are otherwise mm -hmm. beneficial to we, the community. So did you go to Elwood City and ask them, give us a special rate? We did. We okay, did. so if the bill passed and rates had to be uniform, you wouldn't even have the opportunity to ask, albeit it didn't work for you, right? No, they, um, they, that, they that's did. That's what the bill says, uniform. Yeah, it is, it, I think it's uniform the way they charge with the, the bill's broken out into uh, a kilowatt usage, your, your usage of energy, your mm -hmm. demand, and then it was a, a, a power adjustment, rate power adjustment, and that's what seems to fluctuate to the point we just don't know where it's gonna be. Every, every month is kind of a surprise when you get it. In, in the past, it's, it's it was, it's been double in the past. It's we've we've paid twenty thousand dollars in a rate adjustment. Don't even know where it's coming right. from. How do you so calculate? Right. So the fluctuation in rates is as big a problem as it's, the cost. That's that's correct. Good. Thank you very much, um, Representative Zimmerman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. 
Uh, I'm just going to make a comment. Uh, uh, the chairman pretty much asked my question on special rates, but I, I'm a big believer in um, limiting regulations and um, having local go local government, local control over these kinds of issues. And I really see this bill as actually adding to regulation and really taken away from local government in many ways. And so it's hard for me to uh, to support a bill uh, as it is, and and just looking at and hearing from uh, uh, Mr. Thompson and Mr. Oaks, uh, Effort of Bar has been doing this since 1902, which was back before this building was built, and it's been working well. Uh, they have a thriving downtown, um, so there there's some things that are really happening and being done well. So. <clears throat> My question revolved around special rates, of whether you ask for them. And the other thing is, what are, what are they saying as leadership of Elwood City? Have they spoken to any of the other um, municipalities that this is actually working well? Do you know whether there's been any dialogue with anyone I, else? I don't know. No, I, I can't speak for that, no. All right. But that's uh, pretty much the content of what I what I wanted to say. So thanks, Madam Chair. Thanks, Representative Mahaffey. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, this is actually to Patrick, um, if you could. Uh, you talked a lot about poverty, and uh, we have a, an extensive program that as state representatives we pass along and try to help people that have problems paying their electric bills called LIHEAP. Yes. And I'm sure you're you're familiar with that. Is that something that the boroughs offer, the boroughs that have electric, can they get into that program? Uh, yes, thank you for the excellent question. I am familiar with uh, the LAHIP program. I'm actually the chair of the LAHIP Advisory Committee to the Department of Human <coughs> Services. Um, so the answer to that question is, uh, like all good answers, it depends. Um, certainly if the electricity being provided is the primary heating source for the household, um, then the household would be eligible for the LAHIP program, both cash and crisis grant. However, um, even if it's not the primary heating source, if it's a secondary heating source, meaning if it's necessary to run um, a furnace, for example, a natural gas furnace or a, an oil boiler, um, then the household would also be eligible um, to receive LIHEAP. Um, and that LIHEAP grant either could go to um, the uh, household directly um, if the participating municipality is not a licensed vendor with the Department of Human Services, or if they are a vendor, it would go directly to the utility and be applied to the household's utility bill. LIHEAP is available, and it's an essential resource for vulnerable households. I would submit, however, um, that LIHEAP is available um, in addition to some of these protections for um, customers of regulated public utilities um, as well. So it's also available for the PPLs and the AMEDEDs of the world in the same fashion as I just described, primary or secondary heating source. So the boroughs do offer this then? I mean, this is something that the boroughs are, are a, you're able to use with the boroughs that provide electric, is that correct? Um, when you say the boroughs offered, I'm not sure I quite understand your question. LIHEAP is administered by the state of Pennsylvania through correct. the Department of Human Services. All of the dollars come from the federal government. And so the, the person or entity that has to apply for LIHEAP is the low-income household, um, him or herself. But but when, I, when you said that it can come right off the electric bill, that's something that boroughs do. Do they, do they have to enter into that, or how does that They would have work? to, uh, and I don't um, off the top of my head know which, if any of the 35 boroughs are licensed vendors, but the Department of Human Services has a uh, vendor agreement for uh, heating uh, providers um, that they could enter into, and if they entered into that vendor agreement, then it would be directly applied to the low-income household's energy bill. If the low-income household is served by a provider that isn't a licensed vendor, they can still get the grant, but the dollars are sent directly to the household. So they can get it either through the electric bill or through their own? Correct. Okay, very correct. good. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming, especially those of you who traveled long distances. I appreciate your being here. I think we had a lively discussion, and I appreciate your testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're